Well, we'll continue to uh, work through some of these, uh, what I consider to be basic uh, foundational uh, issues uh, that uh, are extensions of the uh, Lordship of Christ, uh, which is where we began uh, the class way back in week one. Uh, without the foundation of his Lordship, there's nothing to build on. Uh, but when we put the foundation of his lordship down, you know, then we can begin to uh, to build a, a practical house that will take us into life, that will take us into ministry, that will take us into uh, healthy family relationships, all of, all of these things that uh, to me are very, very important. And, and, and really some of the things that I've been sharing with you, uh, you know, the whole uh, understanding of the blessing, you know, these, these are like basic uh, life principles uh, that God uh, has has made real to me, you know, over the years. Uh, you know, some of it's come from reading, but uh, most of this has uh, come from, you know, my own personal interaction with the Word of God, my response to it, or my lack of response to it, and the fruit that that's brought. And so these are the things that we're going to be looking at. And so we want to conclude uh, the section that we began last time by looking at this whole issue of work as worship. And again, I, I wanted to try to expand our understanding of what worship is. Uh, is, is worship when we uh, stand, uh, you know, in a sanctuary with a worship band, uh, you know, and we're just giving ourselves uh, in love abandoned to the Lord? Uh, yes, that's absolutely worship. Uh, but really, we, we need to begin to see our whole life as an expression of worship. And, and work, you know, is not only something that God calls us, uh, to do in a place of excellence, uh, but he also calls us to move in whatever work that we're doing uh, from a place of seeing it as worship, giving adoration to him. Uh, one of the books that I read, uh, you know, way, way back was probably one of the, the first uh, three or four Christian books that I read after I had come to the Lord, and the, uh, you know, the book was called uh, Practicing the Presence of God, uh, by Brother Andrew, probably still you know, considered to be one of those classic uh, books. And, and basically we're talking about a monk you know, who, who began to talk about how even in the menial tasks of uh, you know, washing dishes, as an example, uh, where he was uh, washing dishes because of, uh, uh, you know, he'd been involved in the food preparation for Brother Monks, and so now he's, uh, you know, he's, he's washing up. And, and there's the, the sense that he began to realize that, that God is really with me every second of the day. Uh, we, we, we really don't live that way too much. We become aware of his presence at different times of the day. Uh, but to, uh, to have the, uh, the opening mindset as soon as my eyes pop open, that not only has he been with me for the whole night, uh, but now he's with me. He's walking with me moment by moment. Through, through everything that I do this day. And, and Brother Andrew's basic thesis was that if you begin to practice that kind of presence, uh, the reality that uh, everything that you're doing, everything that you're saying, you know, what you're doing right now, what you're going to be doing at, uh, you know, 930, what you're doing at uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon and on through the day, he is there with you. And if he's there with me, uh, somehow uh, that needs to become uh, an expression of worship. And so we really need to begin to see the whole of our life as worship. Uh, it, it's not just, uh, you know, worship in the sanctuary. and It's not just work. Uh, but when we're on the, uh, uh, you know, when we're on the, the basketball court, when we're on the soccer field, uh, you know, whatever it is we're doing, you know, if we're sitting in a movie, you know, watching a movie, uh, it, it should be uh, an expression of saying, you know, you know, he is he is here with me. Uh, he, he's experiencing this with me, uh, and I want to experience it in a way that will give honor uh, to him. Well, we laid down, uh, you know, three principles so far. We're going to look at a fourth, and then we're going to change gears into another uh, practical topic. But we had said, why uh, should worship uh, work be worship? Number one, uh, God is excellent. And we said that's the ultimate uh, goal that we have, to, uh, to be like him. And all of the works that he does are excellent works. Now, he does it in the sense of perfection. And we said we can never, we can never be excellent in the sense of being perfect, but excellence means I'm going to do the best that I can do. Uh, so God is excellent. God is pleased with an offering of sacrifice. 
Uh, that was just so moving to me when uh, God began to make that personal application from Malachi. Uh, you know, people that were bringing diseased animals. It's like, you know, well, we might as well give this to God. We, uh, we It's really of, of no practical use to us. Uh, you know, this uh, this animal is basically a deformed animal, so I'll give it to God. Uh, you know, God says, do you think I'm pleased with that? Now, I want to receive from your hands the very best. And again, that applies to everything that we do. You know, what kind, you know, when I'm, when I'm sitting down to reading, uh, even to read a textbook, uh, to ask the question, how can I read, do this reading assignment uh, in a way that is excellent, uh, that's going to give honor, you know, honor to the Lord? Or do I just offer that piece of my day as uh, I'm just going to kind of do it. It's an assignment I've got to do. I've got to give accountability at the end. And, and, and we just kind of move into that, that mindset. That's really basically the essence of, of bringing a, a diseased or a lame or a flawed animal uh, because we don't offer animals now in 2013. We offer our lives every single day as a living sacrifice. And then thirdly, we said everything we do is for the Lord, and he deserves excellence. Uh, I shared with you the story, uh, you know, from my uh, working in the factory that, uh, you know, sometimes the requirement of the foreman and the Lord Jesus is exactly the same. You know, but sometimes the Lord basically will put the question to you, uh, do you want to please your supervisor? Uh, do you want to uh, fulfill the requirement maybe that your mom and dad put on you? Uh, and, you know, that's what they are expecting and that's what you're doing. Or, you know, do you want to, to please and honor me? Because sometimes he says, my, my, my requirement, my bar is up here. Uh, the requirement of the, uh, the bare minimum is down here but I'm up here. Now, sometimes the requirement is the same, but sometimes it's different, and that we always have to have our hearts open, <laughs> tuned in uh, to the Lord. How can I honor you? You know, in the end, uh, if no one else has come around me and said, uh, you know, you did a good job, uh, if no one else says that, but if in my heart, you know, I feel his affirmation, I feel him saying, well done, my son, uh, you know, then that's, uh, that's what I live for, and that has to be a mark of everything that we do. Uh, all of the work uh, that we do. Lastly, I want to talk just a little bit about the re rewards of excellence. And again, sometimes I, I look at a principle like this and I want to be very clear that I'm never saying, okay, I do certain things to get this. I'm doing something to get something. I'm giving to get something. I'm sacrificing to get a blessing. No, we need to be doing what God is asking us to do with excellence because we want to honor him and please him. But if we plant those kind of seeds in the ground of our life, you know, they will produce a certain kind of fruit. A heart that says, I want to do everything with excellence will produce a certain kind of fruit. And sometimes it's the fruit where we get the affirmation of people in the kingdom, and sometimes uh, it's the fruit of people who aren't in the kingdom at all. And I used an example of that uh, in the book of Daniel. Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Really, that kind of gives us the root, uh, that if I'm going to be doing excellent work, uh, it has to come from an excellent spirit. And the king gave a uh, thought to setting him over the whole realm. Now, the translation, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. I think that, uh, and again, you, you notice in, the, in Daniel there was this consistent uh, application of doing an excellent job, even in a position of slavery, uh, wanting to discipline himself, uh, to be that kind of excellent person, you know, even in a negative situation. As we look at that, uh, you know, I, I think that there's really basically all uh, three things that are always going to mark uh, any ministry that God has for us in the future. Number one, it has to begin with his call. Uh, the call of God is what comes to you, and with that call comes the anointing, you know, to move in what he's, he's called you to move into. But then there has to come the confirmation, you know, from the people of God, 
Uh, you know, the, uh, the call has to come from God, the confirmation has to come from the people, but the actual application that brings us into the place where, where we're even recognized in a confirming way is, is the personal discipline and the hard work that's involved. Ministry is hard work. Uh, you know, work, working a secular job is hard work too. Uh, but ministry uh, is, is, is hard work. You know, it's, it's wonderful. It's fulfilling. You know, when the call of God is there on your life. But, uh, but it doesn't come easy. And, and as I look at the, those three things together, the call coming from God, the confirmation coming from his people, the discipline and the work coming from you. Uh, I, I think of uh, when I graduated from Elam, I was beginning to get a sense of uh, from different things that had happened, different ministries I had been involved with when I was a student here. I began to get a sense of, you know, I think that uh, one of the calls that God has on my life is to teach. But, uh, but nobody wanted me to teach anywhere. I mean, they didn't even, uh, my ch- local church didn't even want me to teach a Sunday school class. And so I'm saying, well, you know, what's up with that? I had three years of Bible school. Uh, you know, I'm not the, uh, the most mature spiritual pencil in the box but uh, you know I've, I, I think I've got something to give and uh, now you know, nobody wanted me to do anything so uh, but I have the sense of the call of God you know kind of working in my heart God saying you know you're going to be involved in teaching uh, I, I've, I've got an anointing on your life to teach the anointing really isn't something that you pray for when you're doing it I mean you can uh, you can pray for the release of it uh, but the anointing is something that really comes to you you know, with the call that God brings into your life. So I remember as, uh, we were living over in the neighboring town. I was doing the factory job I told you about. And I, I said to, to Connie one day, I said, I think I'm going to, I said, I really feel like uh, I want to go after the Old Testament, really study that, you know, even uh, in a way that perhaps down the road I could teach it. Uh, I, like you in this kind of a setting, you take certain courses and you think you're even reading a book or you're reading a book of the Bible and you're saying, Wow, you know, I'd like to really go back and get some more out of this, but you know, I've got to push on, you know, to the next assignment. I've got to push on to the next project. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a big overview. I wish I could stop. I wish I could camp here. Well, I kind of felt that with the whole Old Testament. So I began to. Uh, uh, I said, I, I'm just going to begin to study it. And as I began to study it, uh, and this is in the days before, you know, internet uh, availability, you know, I'd come over to the Elam Library, even though I wasn't a student, and I'd take certain books out. And, uh, and not only did I begin to study it for my own, you know, my own personal growth and development, but I began to, pre- began to prepare an extensive teaching notebook. I can remember there was a group of guys in the apartment complex that I was always, uh, we had a little basketball court out in front of the apartments, and I was always playing ball out there. And, uh, I remember one night I was just so involved, you know, with this particular thing, and and so they came knocking at the door, and you know, three or four guys came to the table, and uh, yeah, come on out, you know, and I said, well, I, I'm not going to come out tonight. I I'm really involved in this uh, this study project, and they said, oh, what are you doing? And you know, one of them was a believer, uh, two of them were non-Christians, and I said, well, I'm uh, I'm actually uh, you know preparing a, a a study notebook. I'm doing an extensive study of the Old Testament, and I'm preparing a study notebook. And and so the one person says, uh, oh, you know, you uh, uh, what are you where are you going to be teaching this? I said, uh, I have no idea. He said, you mean you're you're preparing for? Have you had an invitation to do something? I said, no. Nobody wants me to do anything. And so they're kind of looking at me like I'm from another planet. You know, hey, come out and play ball. And, and, and many times I did go out and play ball, but that night I said, no, I'm, I'm going to give myself to this. I'm pulling on something, and I don't want to let it go. And so the discipline, uh, you know, I would uh, sometimes, uh, you know, put up, uh, you know, the little high chair, you know, for my daughter. She would be right by me there, and she'd have her little coloring book and crayons, and uh, she, she just kind of liked to study with Daddy and, uh, you know, play with the books. And, uh, you know, so we had a little fellowship that way going on. But I'm systematically preparing. Well, now fast forward. A couple more years, and I get a call from the leadership here, and they say uh, at at that time there was a big campus bookstore, and so uh, Paul Johansson was actually the one who called me, and he said we'd like would like you to come and manage uh, the bookstore at Elam, uh, which also would mean managing the snack bar, and I thought well you know that uh, certainly sounds like like ministry to me, to be involved in a in a Bible school you know to be able to put books in the hands of students this is terrific. 
So, uh, so I said yes and uh, went through a number of interviews, and they hired me. And it was about a year and a half uh, into that. Paul Johansson actually came in uh, to the bookstore. Well, actually, what happened almost immediately was there was a required Sunday school class that all the freshmen had to do uh, for their first 16 weeks. And I think at that time there was about 105 freshmen. And they had two different classes that they offered. And the freshmen could choose which one they wanted to go to. So uh, as I'm uh, you know, there in the bookstore one day, uh, one of the leaders says, we'd like you to, uh, to take one of those classes. We'd, you know, what would you, we're, we're thinking maybe of a, a New Testament book you know, for the, you know, to go over the course of the semester. So I said, uh, well, you know, maybe because I, I've been really working in Philippians, and I said, maybe I'll teach Philippians. Would that be okay? And they said, uh, yeah, that would be wonderful. So anyway, so I, I'm saying now, you know, I've got an opportunity to teach. And so the first day, uh, you know, the classes were, you know, over there in college, uh, college hall, and they were kind of separated. Uh, you know, one, the, the other teacher was on the other side, and he already uh, had uh, quite a following. And so of 105 people on the first day, uh, I had five. And he had 100 because he could go where he wanted to go. And I said, well, that's good. If I can keep these five, this, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled with that. I'm, I'm doing, you know, the call of God is starting to come forth now. And the next, uh, next week, uh, there was about 15 in my class. And uh, fast forward a couple more weeks, and I had about 90 in my class. And that so got the attention of the president of the school, Carlton Spencer, uh, that uh, he, he came and sa- started to sit in on the class. And after he sat in, he said to me one day, he said, he said uh, Stacy, he said, uh, you know, you are, uh, you, you are an amazing teacher, he said. This wasn't uh, my, my words, and it wasn't even my perception of myself, but, and I, you know, I'm, I'm just a novice. I'm saying, you know, what do I know? But he said, no, you, are, you, you really have a gift to teach. We've got, we got, we got to figure a way to get you involved. And so fast forward to the next semester, and now Paul Johansson is standing in the bookstore, and he says to me, he said, we'd like to uh, maybe have you teach a class in the fall. He said, the class that would be open would be Old Testament survey. He said, do you think you would uh, be able to handle a class like that? And I said, well, let me, let me show you something. And I went over to the little file cabinet there, and I opened the file cabinet, and I pulled out the, uh, you know, all of the work that I had literally been doing for years. And I had, I had to tell you, uh, you know, quite a substantial, you know, it was, a, it was actually more than one notebook. And I remember Paul Johansson looked, and he's, he's flipping through the pages, he's saying, you, you did this when you didn't, you didn't have anything to, to teach in this area? And I said, uh, I just knew there was going to be a day somewhere, to, you know, sometime there would be an open door, and I wanted to be ready, ready to walk through it when it came. So I didn't, I found about, about, about this much later, but he went into the leadership meeting at that time and he said, uh, you know, we have got to get this kid, you know, in the classroom. And at that point, I was the youngest uh, faculty member that had ever been hired at Yale Bible Institute. Uh, but it was because of the work, you know, that I did in preparation. So I had the call come from God. I had the confirmation come from leadership and uh, even the people that began to gravitate towards my class but then when the door was really open because I had an excellent spirit to work when there wasn't any requirement to do it uh, you know I was ready to step into that and I taught that class for many years I mean uh, these days I'm probably most known for my marriage and family class or at least most identified uh, with the marriage and family class, but uh, for many, many years, uh, students most identified me with Old Testament survey uh, because I, I just poured myself into that class like it was uh, the most important class in the world. So the rewards of excellence will come, but you don't plant the seeds to get the rewards. You plant the seeds because of the first three principles that we looked at. All right, I'm going to move uh, into a different topic now, and it's going to look a little uh, strange to you. Safeguarding God's underwear. And you say, okay, what kind of underwear does he wear? Does he do boxers or briefs? 
I gave you a couple of possibilities, I think. I think that God on Valentine's Day would wear the, the boxers with the hearts on them. He's got a heart for the whole world. But you say, you know, what in the world are you talking about? And I'm not trying to, uh, you know, take you into, you know, some kind of crazy zone here. Uh, but really, when I was a few years ago studying the book of Jeremiah just for my own, I, I was struck uh, by a passage in Jeremiah 13 and verses 1 to 11. And we're going to look at that. And out of this uh, rather strange story, uh, I'm going to, uh, to make what I consider to be a most important foundational block you know, that you need to put, you know, that you need to build in uh, to your commitment to the Lordship of Christ. Let's kind of look at uh, the verses together. The first six verses, this is what the Lord said to me. Go and buy a linen loincloth, which is the uh, Old Testament equivalent of underwear, as I'll show you in a moment, even from the Hebrew word, and put it on. But do not wash it. So I bought the loincloth as the Lord directed me, and I put it on. Then the Lord gave me another message. Take the linen loincloth you are wearing and go to the Euphrates River. Now, assuming that Jeremiah is in the Jerusalem area, we're talking about a journey of several hundred miles. So God is saying to him, take the loincloth off, Go to the Euphrates River, which is the border of Israel, the border between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. Go to that river and hide it in a hole in the rocks. So he goes to the Euphrates River, finds some location, uh, you know, basically digs a hole, puts rocks on top of the hole. He's buried his underwear. And so I went and hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord had instructed me. You're thinking, you know, boy, God, he can just think of the weirdest things, you know, sometimes. You look at, especially with some of the things he asked the prophets to do. You know, sleep on this side, you know, sleep on that side. Uh, but, it's a, but there's always a powerful prophetic message that's connected. And so I, I began to look at this. And I, I'm just trying to put myself in the place of the man of God. You know, here's this great prophet. And, you know, God's saying, you know, go by you know, a pair of underwear, well, okay, you know, so I'll go buy a pair of underwear. Uh, don't wash it before you put it on. Well, okay, you know, I, I can live with that too, I guess. You know, so now I'm wearing the underwear. But then to take a several hundred mile journey and bury it in the ground, uh, you know, because God said to me, you, you know, I was beginning to wonder if, uh, you know, perhaps the words I, were, I was hearing from the Lord at that point were, you know, related to the uh, the hot wings that I ate the night before or something like that. But uh, anyway, that's what he did. And and then it says, a long time afterward. So we don't know what, what that means. Weeks, some series of months, who knows. Uh, but uh, a long time afterward, the Lord said to me, go back to the Euphrates and get the loincloth I told you to hide there. Now at this point, you're thinking, oh, you know, give me a break. Another several hundred mile journey to try to dig up you know a pair of underwear that I buried by the Euphrates River y can you really be serious but the passage continues so I went to the Euphrates and I dug it out of the hole where I had hidden it but now it was rotting and falling apart well you know no no kidding the loincloth was good for nothing just kind of mark that phrase in your mind. The loincloth was good for nothing. Then I received this message from the Lord. So now God's going to drive home the point. This is what the Lord says. This shows how I will rot away the pride of Judah and Jerusalem. These wicked people refuse to listen to me. They stubbornly follow their own desires and worship other gods. Therefore, they will become like this loincloth, good for nothing. As a loincloth clings to a man's waist, so I created Judah and Israel to cling to me. As underwear clings to a man's waist or loins, so I created my people to cling to me. God is basically saying there. 
They were to be my people, my pride, uh, my glory, and honor to my name, but they would not listen to me. All right, let's begin to to work with this uh, very, very strange parable. God communicates basically four different times in connection with this parable. He says to Jeremiah, buy and wear the undergarment. Now the word there for undergarment or loincloth is the Hebrew word ezor, E-Z-O-R. Let me give you the definition from Brown, Driver, and Briggs. It says, Ezor refers to the innermost piece of clothing. And the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says, unlike the girdle, which was kind of like the outward thing that that tied the robe together for the dress at that time, unlike the girdle, it was worn next to the skin. So Jeremiah is basically instructed to buy a garment uh, that is going to be next to his skin. And in fact, uh, you know, next to that, that part of the skin that for male and female is considered the most private area. So he's bought this undergarment. Then he's told to bury it. After he's worn it for a while, he buries it. And then after he's made the journey all the way back, I mean, it would be quite a while just to do the journey on foot. But after he's been back in Israel for a while, God says, dig up the undergarment. And of course, when he digs up the undergarment, it's spoiled, it's rotten. Now let's uh, begin to break this down, and then we'll begin to apply it in a way that you know connects with uh, what I consider to be the core meaning here. The explanation of the parable uh, comes, you know, in verse eleven. The undergarment, and we read this together just a moment ago, represents the people of the Lord who have been purchased by the Lord. Now carefully track with me here because I think that this is a, this is such an important connection. And God says, I purchased them to cling to my body in a most private, intimate way. So we're seeing here the connection of the people of the Lord and their connection to the body of the Lord. And maybe you can see where I'm going with this. Guarding God's underwear is going to basically be under the umbrella of understanding and guarding the commitment that we need to be making in our identification with the local church. Because where is the body of the Lord today? The body of the Lord today is made up of living stones. The body of the Lord today is expressed in the ongoing ministry of the local church worldwide. And God is saying, yes, you know, I purchased you for personal intimacy with me. That's where it starts. You know, I am to cling to the Lord, uh, to cling to His Spirit, uh, to be involved in the most intimate personal connection with Him. But it goes even beyond that. I have to say, as part of the loincloth, you know, how do I connect with his body? And his body now brings me into relationship with the people around me. It's significant that when God says, buy it, he's saying uh, it doesn't need to be washed, or I don't want you to wash it. That's kind of a picture of, you know, when God brings us into relationship with, you know, he's already washed us. We're, we're already clean. But the principle that we see, thirdly, is that if we abandon our purpose, which is to cling to his body, and I'm going to make that 
a twofold application throughout this teaching. Clinging to the Lord personally himself and clinging to the body of Christ, to the people of God. If I abandon that for any reason, if I move away from my relationship with the Lord, I begin to fall apart and I become useless. But I also believe the same is true in connection with the body of Christ. If I move away from the body of Christ, you know, I begin to uh, fall apart, using the actual word from the verses that we read, and, and I am in danger of becoming useless. Larry Kreider, to give you a quote from his book, Building on the Basic Truths of Christianity, in his uh, fifth chapter, he says the importance of the local church. We need each other. And he gives this little uh, story. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's very you know, illustrative. I once read the story of a young man who had given his life to God. But after a time of disappointment and disillusionment, he began to withdraw from other Christians. The young man's pastor stopped in for a visit one cold, blustery winter evening. And with the wind howling outside, they sat and talked. After a while, the pastor walked over to the fireplace and with a pair of prongs, picked up a hot coal from the fire, placing it on the bricks in front of the fireplace. He continued to converse with the young man. Then glancing at the ember of the bricks, he said, Do you see that piece of coal? While it was in the fireplace, it burned brightly. But now that it's alone, the ember has almost gone out. The pastor walked over to the fireplace and with the prongs picked up the ember and placed it inside the fireplace. Uh, within minutes, the dying ember was again burning brightly. It suddenly dawned on the young man what the pastor was trying to tell him. When we move away from the warm and encouraging fires of fellow believers in the body of Christ, we will eventually cool down spiritually. Joining with others as a community of believers in a local church body keeps our fires glowing. From that day on, the young man made a decision to join regularly with other believers in a local church community. He did not want to take the chance of his fire uh, going out again. Let's begin to pull on this even a little bit more. I want to draw some of these principles from the book of Jeremiah. And now the application, looking first of all at the verse at the bottom, which is a very important New Testament verse. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. That's not the only verse in the New Testament that says that, but clearly here Paul says the church is the body of Christ in the earth. Now, for many years, I, I saw that basically as a, uh, uh, a, a kind of like an allegory. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like the body of Christ. It's, it's, it's trying to give me a picture you know, of what it's like to be a part of the church. But when Jack Hayford was here one time for a, a series and was teaching, I remember he said, you know, please never see the body of Christ as an allegory. Uh, you know, it, it, is, it is a literal reality a literal spiritual reality in the earth today that is you know we, we're, we're not part of an allegory or a symbol you know we are the body of Christ he is the head in heaven you know but we are the body that's what Jesus meant when he said greater works shall you do than even the works that I've done well you know I've heard the the different miracle teachings saying that that means we'll just uh you know, our, our, our miracles will be even greater than Jesus. I don't think so. You know, I, I think it's going to be kind of hard to get greater than feeding 5,000 people with a bag lunch or bringing a man out of the grave that's been dead for a few days, uh, healing uh, lepers who, who, who couldn't have been treated even if there was modern medicine uh, in a way that would, uh, uh, you know, bring healing to their life. Uh, is, is Jesus saying we're going to be you know, greater in the sense of you know, more significant miracles? No, I don't think that's what he was saying. But what he was saying is that when I ascend into the heavens, the Holy Spirit is going to fall. 
And when the Holy Spirit falls in Acts chapter 2, we, according to 1 Corinthians 12, were baptized by the Spirit into one body. And so now we are the body of Christ in the earth. The greater miracles and the greater works are going to be, yet. Yeah, we're going to be doing the same things but we're going to be doing them all around the world simultaneously because the body of Christ can spread in that way. It's a powerful principle of multiplication. You know, if Jesus is in Jerusalem, he can't be uh, in the town of Cana. And if he's in the uh, town of Cana, you know, he can't be uh, you, you know, in another area. He can't be across the Jordan River. You know, his, his body, while it was on the earth, was, was limited and focused to, to one particular spot or one particular area. True, you know, in, in the area of faith, you know, his power could extend and he, it brings healing to a, a, a person when he's not even there. Uh, you know, of course he can do that. But what the picture that, he, that, that he's seen in his mind is that the body of Christ that is going to begin with that group of disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is going to spread into all the world. And so now we are the body of Christ. The only, uh, you know, as you move through the earth as his body, and you, 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 t- you pass a, a person who's hurting and in a place of need. The only touch there we're going to have from the body of Christ is the touch that they're going to have from you as you release the Holy Spirit through your life. So the application of the parable is, number one, we are called to cling to the Lord. That's where it starts. And there's really a part of me that says, you know what? That's really where I would like it to end. I love dealing with Jesus. You know, even in the midst of stuff that happens in my life that certainly isn't the way that I would have planned it. But, uh, you know, Jesus is good to deal with. But it's you people. It's the person on our right and our left. It's the person across on the other side of the church you know, where we're, we're attending. And we're saying, God, do you, do you really expect me to relate to that idiot? <laughs> I mean, you know, that, you know, you know, that person is, I, I, I would be much you know, better off. And there's part of me at, at different times that have said, uh, uh, y- y- you know, I could just go into a monastery like the one over in the, our, our neighboring uh, community here, Pittsburgh, the Carmelite Monastery. You know, you go in, you move in silence all year long. You're only allowed, uh, you know, two or three visits a year, and the person has to look at you through a, a grid screen. And, you know, and all you do is pray and fellowship and, you know, just, uh, you know, minister to, to Christ. You know, I could get into that on a lot of days. And then, of course, other days, you know, I look at my wife and I say, hmm, she wouldn't be there. Uh, you know, maybe that wouldn't be such a good idea after all. But uh, when I look at my relationship with the whole body of Christ, at times I've said, you know, there's a real attractiveness to that. Just cling to the Lord. But Jeremiah gets the message that it's not just clinging to the Lord. We're called to cling. Because we are the loincloth of God, we are clinging actually to his body. And so the application for us is it's a call to be in relationship with God's people, the local church, which is not an allegory for his body, which is his body. Now, the personal relationship with God is vertical. That's intimacy with him, hearing his voice. Relationship with his body is horizontal. People of God, fellowship with God's people, relationship with the local church. If you do the vertical only, now this is the, uh, the problem sometimes that has existed as you look at church history. Uh, if you do the vertical only, you end up in a monastic mindset. Uh, you end up uh, looking pasty white in some secluded corner where you know, the only thing you do is just get in the corner and you know, pray and and, and worship and you know you're just doing that all the time and you know you're over there by yourself and you're just with the Lord and don't bother me uh, you know get you know get, get out of my face you know I don't want to have to deal with you 
Uh, if that's the way that we move, we, we end up in the, the mindset of a monastery, which is uh, you know, basically a, you know, a person that is relating only to God and really, for all fundamental purposes, not having a dramatic impact on their world. Now, the, the pendulum has swung the other way in church history as well, where it's been the horizontal only, where, you know, I'm, I'm just going to focus, uh, you know, I don't have to worry too much about my relationship with my Lord. My, Lord. my relationship with the Lord is, is basically defined by my relationship with other Christians in the body of Christ. Well, if you, uh, you move horizontally only, you know, you end up with uh, some kind of social club. You've got lots of fellowship, but no power. And so if it's vertical only, you have power without influence. If it's horizontal only, you have influence without power. And it's those two concepts brought together that really releases us you know, into a place where we can make a power, you know, not only have the power that comes from the intimate relationship with the Lord, uh, but also comes uh, as I impact this hurting, dying world that needs the touch of the body of Christ, of which I am a part. Bill Hybels, who's the, uh, one of the authors of the, uh, the book Fit to be Tied that some of you are reading for Marriage and Family, says the local church is the only hope of the world. And I've taken Bill Hybels' statement and tried to make it better, presumptuous me, I say the local church and the power of the Spirit is the only hope of the world. Well, why am I even hitting this? We're going to look at a couple of things. Cling, when God says, I want my loin, the loincloth, my people, to cling to me. Cling is the Hebrew word dabak. It's the same word used by God in Genesis to talk about the whole issue of a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. We'll actually be talking about that verse tomorrow morning in the marriage and family class together. But Dombach means being joined and sticking together in affection and loyalty. And the Hebrew word actually has the connotation of adherence through collision through a powerful impact, kind of like taking silly putty and throwing it against the wall and it just splats. You know, now it's just hanging there as part of the wall. There's a, a cleaving because of the collision that took place. And that's a principle in the area of marriage. You know, sometimes the deepest expression of unity comes through the splat you know, of a collision of two individual personalities. And so it is with the Lord. And so God is saying, I want you to cling to me uh, in that way. As we look at an example of what I really want to address and challenge, George Barna in his book, Finding Vibrant Faith Beyond the Walls of the Sanctuary, uh, published uh, a few years ago. I don't have the date. I'm going to give you uh, some quotes from Mr. Barna. We are in the midst of a spiritual revolution that is reshaping Christianity, personal faith, corporate religious experience, and the moral contours of the nation. He talks about 20 million revolutionaries having a first century lifestyle based on faith, goodness, love, generosity, kindness, and simplicity who pursue an intimate relationship with God. Mr. Barna, I'm with you so far. The spiritual revolution entails drawing people away from reliance upon a local church into a deeper connection with and reliance upon God. So George Myers says, one of the trends in our, in our society today is that this powerful spiritual revolution, as he calls it, uh, is actually causing people to be pulled from relationship to the local church, focusing on God alone. 
whether you become a revolutionary immersed in, minimally involved, or completely disassociated from a local church, this is a quote right from the book, is irrelevant to me, George Barna says, and within boundaries to God. It's irrelevant to me whether you're connected with the local church. Well, what I want to show you uh, when we come together on Friday is why you know, that statement, I believe, is a false statement, an incorrect statement. Uh, I have no question about uh, you know, Barna's uh, you know, ability to, uh, to take statistics and to see the trends. And, and in fact, I think it's a very, very accurate trend because you have a whole group of Christian people today that basically say, I can get it on fine with Jesus, but uh, don't ask me to, uh, to get it on with the people of God. As a matter of fact, if I, if I go to church at all, it's going to be related to, you know, I'll maybe get online and watch a church service. Or I'll turn on, uh, you know, a televangelist and, you know, get a little church that way. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to be a part of a local body. Well, I want to show you uh, really what a, what a horrendous uh, decision that is if we ever come in to that mindset. We'll pick it up there uh, on Friday. God bless you.